So, hello again, everyone. We're back for a, a redo of yesterday's void moon, <laughs> void moon thing. I thought that was that was pretty funny because it's the classic, uh, the classic, uh, I don't know, astrological, astrological comedy. The the void moon. You know, one way to to explain it to give you a a, a live event. Uh, Someone in my family at one point found this, um, you know, one of those things online where someone is selling, I think it was a mop or some kind of thing for the kitchen and they bought it on the void moon and they, they kind of, they, I think they found out either when they were doing it or just after they, it, it was established, this thing was a void moon thing. So the mop arrives and then they used it for a while and then something happened where they could return it or something and then, but it didn't work out. Bottom line was that the whole thing was a, was a nothing burger. It's, it, it was there and then. It was gone, like nothing happened, and that's the classic way the the void moon can can um, you know can take place. And then yesterday, that's you know part of the course where I'm talking about it, and then uh, what ends up happening is that I didn't record it, but this time I've got it, so uh, everything should be fine. Now I'm going to uh, try to cover approximately the same thing as yesterday, and in the meantime, I already put up on Patreon the images for the slides, so you can find them in the post. And I'm pretty sure you should be able to right click on an image and copy it and paste it somewhere else in case you want to save it to your computer and print it, study it, whatever. Uh, those uh, those slides are important in that what often happens when people are learning astrology is, I think I mentioned yesterday, they, they jump to the story before they're really familiar with the order of things and where things get classified in boxes. And it's not like just because you can put things in boxes, you automatically become a great astrologer. It takes longer than that but the the more the these patterns these orders and these relationships are are really established in your mind the easier it is for your for your logical and your intuitive mind to make those leaps where it'll be it'll be clear to you why things are happening in the way they're happening so it's i, I can't you know emphasize that enough to pay attention to the basics order of the signs the elements where they fall in so as i was saying yesterday when you look at when you look at the uh, am i sharing this hold on a second let's share it now uh, uh this one so um you should be seeing the the cardinal the cardinal cross which is aries libra capricorn cancer they're all cardinal cardinal being at starting action oriented energy and they're all or mostly all at odds in that the elements don't work well together such as aries and capricorn fire and earth or capricorn and libra which is air and earth or libra and cancer which is air and water or aries and cancer which is fire and water However, uh, Aries and Libra are uh, compatible elements, fire and air. So there is that uh, mode of compatibility. And you do see this quite a lot uh, in uh, people that become friends or or, or even you know, partners, marriage partners, opposite signs, because although they're opposite, they balance each other out or they support each other as well, let's say, through the fact that the elements are compatible, right? Um, and this repeats, this cross repeats in the fixed mode, and you get the same the same relationships where uh, air in Aquarius is at odds with water in Scorpio, uh, and it's at odds with earth in Taurus, but it's compatible with fire, Leo, in the opposition. But nevertheless, these are all in the you know challenging dynamic um, alignment, 90 degrees. Another way to remember it too, when you're looking at whether it's cardinal or fixed or mutable, which I'll bring up in a second, 90 degrees is the, the square and then 180 is the opposition. Uh, you could say that, uh, though, you have to be careful with any statement you make in astrology, because as soon as you make it, you find exceptions. However, by the logic of it, the fixed oppositions tend to be a little more difficult than the cardinal oppositions, like the idea of Aries, Libra, Cancer, Capricorn, they're opposed, but with fixed, when you get partnerships in fixed, because people that are of fixed nature have more trouble changing, they're less likely to adapt when conflict results. So, you know, I could mention a number of people across the years, say Taurus, Scorpio, they can feel really compatible at first, but if things go wrong, uh, they can really become enemies and, and have a tremendously hard time with each other because of the fixity, uh, the fixed nature of the situation. And then in the mutable cross, same thing again, fire in Sagittarius at odds with water in Pisces and the same as at odds with 
Virgo in because it's Earth, but then the polarity of Gemini, Sagittarius, fire and air, and then the polarity of Pisces in Virgo, which is water and Earth. And so there you have the, the three modes with all the squares and oppositions. And then uh, again, repeating from yesterday, you switch to the trines where what you're doing is you're cutting the circle in three pieces. So now instead of 90, it's 120. And this gives you uh, three signs that are compatible with each other by element and they are in agreement. Uh, Therefore, and it's what I was I was mentioning that uh, this is something that Carl Jung, the psychologist, had seen in his work that uh, people that were of the same element seemed to uh, show up in his office, you know, a lot more than expected because of that uh, that type of elemental compatibility. And I can tell you that that one is is one that you will spot if you look around and start taking a, you know informal polls of sorts, you'll notice that the elements do tend to get together and this would be the fire element. Then uh, the, the earth element, Capricorn, Taurus, Virgo, uh, same idea, 120 degrees apart. There is agreement, there is harmony, there's flow. And then you switch the air, Aquarius, Gemini, Libra. And finally, water, which is Pisces, Scorpio, and Cancer. All of these work well together. The trine is like that. And of course, it's one thing to hear someone say the trine is like that, and then another to experience it yourself in some way, whether it's because you're following big planets and you have a period where you can see it moving in and then you know, see it, feel it moving in in and then the same see it feel it moving out get an experience of that harmony that can be true if you're following mars jupiter saturn to one of the planets but it's also true even for the moon if you're following the moon it's a great study to notice the difference between one aspect and another and trines uh, nearly always there are some exceptions but nearly always feel harmonious whereas these do not they feel disharmonious in some sense in fact you could say the disharmony of the squares at the worst possible level of manifestation would be difficult events, very irritated energy, or really low, you know, dead energy where you have to rest and you, can, you just can't do anything. That would be the extreme crash um, versus with these trines, things just seem to flow more naturally. Things are working fine and it's pretty, pretty easy to spot, but generally you'll make more headway at first when you're learning. If you try to learn this through the moon, then you will through trying to learn it with a big planet, because if you're in it, it's hard to know what it's like to not be in it. And that can take, sometimes it can take weeks. So it's a more difficult study. And then another grouping would be where now instead of cutting the circle in three pieces, you cut it in six pieces, which you're basically, what you're doing is you're interlacing two trines and you're linking the signs that are harmonious by element, like Taurus, Virgo, Capricorn, Scorpio, Pisces, Cancer. But now what you're doing is you're also showing the compatible elements in that earth and water complement one another. So now if you look at the tips of the star, Capricorn is, is in sextile to Pisces, is in sextile to Scorpio. Uh, therefore, you get 60 degrees, you get agreement, there's support. Any sign, you just look in either direction. Pisces goes toward Taurus and toward Capricorn. Taurus goes toward Cancer and toward Pisces. And it's always earth water, uh, the earth water pattern that you're getting. And then the other one you can do is for fire air, same idea. Uh, you see the trines interlaced, you get this hexagon. And again, Aquarius gets along with Aries, gets along with Sagittarius and Aries in this direction with Gemini with and with Aquarius. It's again, fire and air getting along. So um, this other wheel that will also be part of the post I already put up. Here I'm showing everything in case you want to see it in one place. You've got the sign order, you've got the elements, and you've got the modes. So everything is classified, you know, Scorpio, water fixed, but, uh, you know, some other sign like Pisces is also water, but it's mutable. And if you're trying to grapple with cardinal fixed mutable, cardinal is an initiating, starting, moving kind of energy in terms of taking action, right? I, the people that they want to just launch something, get going. The, probably the most inclined to do that would be Aries because it's the first sign. And you know, Aries sometimes will have a, uh, you'll hear that they start and they don't finish things because the important thing to them is to start. But all four signs, Aries, Cancer, Libra, and Capricorn, that cardinality is the 
the idea of getting going, starting with fixity, where you go into Aquarius, Aquarius, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio. That's where you concentrate energy and you hang in there. You 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 hold tight, which is really good for manifesting. In that you know you concentrate on something and you make it real. And, and you could say that the the energy of cardinality uh, is meant to then manifest through fixity. And this makes perfect sense when you are looking at the signs. You start to notice that the houses where the or, or rather you could say houses or or you could say the sign order. I call them houses more from habit than from the fact that it's an accurate way to describe it. It's much better to call them uh, places or the sign order, but I'll say houses just because it's out there as a, you know, part of the accepted language. And it, for many people, it helps to understand it. The idea being that houses that are fixed or signs that are fixed, two, five, eight and 11, they're manifesting houses in one form or another. It's why the second and eighth connect to money and property and the fifth and 11, the fifth is a creative house. So you're manifesting, for example, the product of four family is you know, quite often children. That's pretty logical, right? Um, the product of relationship seven, eight would be shared shared property, shared money. Um, it's, it's in a way the pooling, two people's uh, money. Whereas here, the self, one, results in two. One is the self, two is the, the property and the money of the self. And up in 11, you get a tennis career. So the 11 is money from career or the results of career, the manifestation of career. So that's that's the strength of the fixity. The problem with fixity is that change is not their thing, particularly because once they have something that they've manifested, they want to hang on to it. And there's something good about that, but you can imagine that there might be something not so good about that in that, uh, you know, to the extent that it would be better to, to leave a, a situation, a relationship, whatever it is, then it would be better, you know, to adapt and change, but it's it's difficult for them to do it. So uh, that's the, uh, the fixed and then mutable. Mutable is the, the idea of mutable is what, what the name implies. It's changeable. It's adaptable. So that's both their strength and their weakness. And that the strength is that it's great to be able to adapt. The, the weakness would be that there's too much change or too much going with the flow, so to speak. This is something to always consider when you're studying astrology. Think of everything as having uh, either, either you could say two poles or even better, think of a frequency where uh, something can be expressed really well or really poorly, depending on all kinds of things that are going on in the chart. And then you can even get into the person's upbringing, genetics, and how they're expressing it. But basically, bottom line is they're expressing it well. They're expressing the harmonious high end of any particular property. And if not, they're expressing it in a, in, in a you know more negative way. So a mutable person, uh, it, if someone is saying, oh, that person, you know, they're, they're admiring what they're, what they're doing, they'll say they're, they're so adaptable. They're able to just go with the flow in situations, whichever situation they're in, they're adapting to do really well. But when being criticized, it's like they can't stick to anything. They just, you know, change from one thing to another and it becomes a problem, right? So that's that slide. And uh, as I've said, I encourage you to look at it, get familiar, and to whatever level you can, memorize the, the, uh, the names of the different places. I found when I was learning, because at the time there were no computers, it, it was a disadvantage in that sense, because I couldn't get access to nearly as much information as I can now. But the advantage was that I did a lot of drawing, which is the kinesthetic uh, dimension, the Visual astrology is very visual. You're always looking at something, although it becomes internally visual as well. The more you practice, the more you can see the charts in your mind, but that's still visual. There's a representation of something that is like there's an image. Kinesthetic is where you're actually engaging the, you know, the touch, you're, you're writing, you're, you're, you're touching things. That's a very good learning mode and it'll imprint in your, in your mind. If you draw charts, you put you know, they put the signs in after a while it becomes second nature. It's like learning a language, all the letters, you know, fall in the right place and everything starts to make sense. And it's just really a matter of a matter of repetition. The final slide that you will see posted in, in Patreon is the ephemeris. And yesterday we, we were talking about how in response to someone's question, you know, what book do you recommend? If you want to learn astrology before, honestly, before you read any books that tell you all about interpretations, meanings, and so on, an ephemeris is critical because if you want to get some understanding. What you're doing is in an ephemeris, you're looking at columns of planets and it won't take you long to realize, like for instance, you're looking at this and you see Jupiter has a 12-year orbit. So it's going to make perfect sense 
that you'll look and you'll say, all right, well, I see it in Aquarius here in 2021, but then it goes into Pisces already a little bit in 21. By 22, it goes through Pisces, then Aries. Then I look a little bit further down, Taurus. Doesn't quite get to Gemini, but you're seeing it go through Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, already in Taurus. Four signs over this period here, which doesn't even cover all of 24. But you, know, you see four. Saturn, though, Saturn, you only see two. You see Aquarius, and then it goes into Pisces. Well, the reason is that Jupiter is a 12-year cycle and Saturn is a 30-year cycle. It just takes longer. And then you switch to Uranus and you don't even see a sign change because Uranus is in Taurus the whole time because Uranus has an 84-year cycle, which means it's going to hang around a sign for seven years, which is you know a lot more than Saturn at two and a half years, way more than Jupiter at one year. Right? Neptune even slower. All you see is Pisces. Matter of fact, you draw this ephemeris month by month going back to 2011 and you'll see Neptune and Pisces the whole time because it's super slow. And you can even scan for detail. Notice that Neptune is as slow as it is. It's a little faster than Pluto because Pluto takes 250 years. So Pluto here, you see it. Actually, you do see it switching signs, but it's because it's at the end of the Capricorn that we're in now. By 2024, it does dip into Aquarius, but it's a very slow moving um, planet. Eris, the last one, I mean, this one is just crawls along very, very slow. You can begin to imagine, right? If you say these planets are affecting my chart, how? By pointing back to where things were when you were born. That's how astrology works. When people say transiting this, transiting that, what does that mean? It means they're here today. Where do they point to in your birth chart? So then you say, well, if I'm looking at Pluto and Eris, especially Eris, if it hits a spot, it's going to hit it for a long time. With Pluto, you're looking at three years minimum of something happening to a certain part of the chart. With Eris, you could be looking at a decade or more because it's super slow. So if it catches an area that is supportive, great. If it catches an area that is difficult, not so great. And then we get into other you know, other discussions about how to work with difficult energy and there are ways. Uh, Trump would be an example of how not to do it. And there are many people that show you how to do it because it can be done. Right. But it's that logic. It's it's keeping in mind that you're looking at these columns and rather than saying, oh, my God, this is Greek. What do I do? Well, obviously, first, you have to be able to recognize, oh, yeah, that's that symbol with the little thing. That's Taurus. Great. OK, I got that. And that goes back to your slides that show you where Taurus is and all that. Or this is like all the Pisces. OK, I see that's where it is. So you start there, but then you start to get better and better at realizing that these planets are going around the sun in these big circles or smaller circles. And their speed starts to give you information as to what's going on, how long it's going to last, all of that stuff, right? It's much simpler than it seems at first, but it takes you looking into that ephemeris for a while. And, you know, the best way, you know, let's face it, we're all more than anything else self-interested. We all want to know what's going to happen to me. So, you know, avail yourself of that and look back, open the ephemeris, start tracking backward, see if you can spot some patterns. That's how I got into this. I, at the beginning of my quest, when I looked at an ephemeris, it was a, in a way an automatic scientific study, sort of. I mean, not exactly scientific, but it's at least subjectively scientific in that there I was in my early 20s and I looked back to events prior to that when I had zero idea about astrology, nothing. And just with the core meanings of planets like Saturn, Pluto, Moon, so I got to grasp that pretty quick within a few months. I was able to see two or three things that kind of shocked me because I thought that's amazingly precise that it would be you know, that particular transit during that month. And that really encouraged me to continue looking, right? So uh, it's, it's, this is the book, let's just say, uh, in summary to what the person was asking yesterday. I will recommend other books. I mean, there, there have been some great books written over the years, some current books as well. They're useful too. But what you'll notice is when you read books by someone else, you'll always get more out of them if you're doing your own searching at the same time, if you're also interested in understanding astrology. One of the things that I do whenever I read anybody saying anything, uh, especially if it's some kind of forecast or some kind of interpretation, I want to know why they're saying what they're saying. You know, I'll think, why is this person pointing this way? And it's both a way to gauge whether it's accurate and to learn potentially something by the way the person is interpreting. So that way uh, you're getting more out of it. And then something I brought up yesterday that I believe led into that whole thing that I talked about how retrogrades work and the ascendant and so forth. So I'll go over that now. When you see these R's in any ephemeris, R's or D's, R's is retrograde. So you see that the planet 
is moving along going forward. And then when it goes to R, then you see it going backward by degree. And then at the D point, it starts to go forward again. So R is retrograde, D is direct, right? And I mentioned that these planets do not actually go retrograde because if they did, it would be a crazy solar system. Right? It would be like some kind of kabuki theater thing. You know, it doesn't work like that. They always move forward. It's just that in this sense, astrology is the study of optical illusions. And yet it's very precise because, you know, this is where a scientist would say, how can you say that you're at the center? We established that the sun is at the center in the middle ages but that's not what astrology is astrology puts you at the center of the planetary forces right and when you take yourself or the earth basically as the center things can look like they're doing things that they're not actually doing and it's actually because of the earth motion itself so the earth will do something in its in its movement that then when you're looking at the night sky or, or the day sky you start to notice well that planet looks like it's going each day it's going backward instead of forward it's not really doing that but because it's doing it in perception optically it works precisely that way and most importantly though and this is really critical uh just like I said yesterday, and I will repeat today, that studying Saturn is a really good way to get your foot in to astrological knowledge and understanding because it's such a critical planet. I would also add to that the idea of stations. When planets station, they radiate a lot more power. And you, when you check your ephemeris, one of the ways you, you'll be able to sort of understand this is you notice that they're moving more slowly as they slow down to go backward or as they slow down to go forward. In both cases, they're moving more slowly. Now, that'll sound a little bit counterintuitive because people always think, well, if something is faster, it's more impactful. In, in astrology and in orbits, it's the opposite. If a planet is moving more slowly, it radiates more power and has more influence. And so this will be true every year. There are points where planets station. Sometimes they station in scattered ways. But the last while, if you check your ephemeris for the last number of years, they often cluster in, in certain parts of the year. And then you get a lot of action because planets are stationed, right? And uh, so this is good to remember, good to practice. And even on the personal level, I do this all the time. When I look at a person's chart, uh, I check, are they born on planet stations? Because those planets, whatever else the chart is saying, those planets take on a lot of power. And I'll give you uh, three examples that come to mind. One example is... Is once again, you know, the orange menace. He's born with a Jupiter station, uh, and I mean, he was really stationed. There was he was born with Jupiter, something like an hour from being stationed, which is really unusual because the precise station of a planet happens months apart. So if you get it on the exact practically hour, I mean, that's like right at the core. This is, you know, Jupiter. Think, think luck, think expansion, think, uh, you know, anything that grows, but think also hyperbole, think arrogance. Think all of that because it's it's the entire archetype. The misuse of Jupiter is expansion running amok. And he's, a, I think, one of the most perfect manifestations of that principle. But, you know, he also, yes, he's had tremendous luck. And you can even tie it to the fact that in his chart, it connects to the house of other people's money. He is just a genius at separating people from their money. I'm amazed at people's, you know, gullibility. He tells them, you know, look, there are pigs flying. The earth is going backwards. Send me $45 to overturn the election. And they send them the money. It's, it's amazing, right? Um, Jupiter, that's the Jupiter. But, you know, if you then say, well, does this mean that it will always work like that forever? No, it doesn't. Because in all charts, you'll see that planets make good angles, hard angles, and eventually a planet can collapse. And, you know, it has to be a near perfect Jupiter and his is not. His Jupiter has some problems. And, you know, you can see that in his transits, you can see it in all kinds of ways. So, uh, but that's the, that's the, 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 the example of being born on a station that way. Then we take Steve Bannon, who recently, you know, was uh, indicted, charged, etc. He's born on a Pluto station. This is the classic wannabe fascist. Pluto, in his way of manifesting it, he, he wants to manifest male plutocratic power. I don't know that you would always necessarily attach it to white supremacy. It's just that in his case, you can, you can see that's what it is. But it could have just been a craving for power just because it's power and not necessarily racially motivated. The racial part, he's happened to attach it in his case. But the behavior, this thing that he, and even his messaging where he says, we need to destroy the, the uh, organized state, destroy, deconstruct the, the, uh, the institutions of government. This is exactly what Pluto wants to do because Pluto wants to deconstruct and recreate. It's just that some people do it benevolently and some people do it malevolently. It's pretty obvious to me which one of those he is, right? 
but at least you can see clearly, draw his chart. I don't even have a time for his chart, but his Pluto is dead stopped when he was born, right? And then, you know, you might be able to project and try to rectify the chart by giving the Pluto extra power, you know, in some way. The main thing is that you know it's it's uh, stationary. And the third that came to mind, it's uh, out there, you probably ran across it, the, uh, Elizabeth Holmes, the, the woman that uh, kind of ran a scam. She was saying that you could just take some drops of blood and create these fancy tests and she was going to solve all the health problems of the world. And she was basically making it up all along for other reasons in the chart. But she also has a really strong Pluto, which is Pluto is the, is, it's just a craving for power as well. It has this quality of, should we think about fascism is like you you bring everything to a point to one person controlling everything so it's not like she says i want to be hitler but it's the the impulse to do that in some fashion and take control of everything and uh, then on the dark side, it does slip into paranoia, which she was known for, you know, and as, as she was confronted more and more with what she was doing and how it wasn't working, she became more and more paranoid. And again, there's this Plutonian energy running amok. So those are examples of people born on that, that type of station, but you can be born on, you know, Mars stations, Mercury stations. You might, for example, surmise, I mean, this is you know, pretty straight up interpretation that if you saw in an ephemeris, a person born on a Mercury station, because Mercury is the planet of communication and Mercury is stopped, that person is likely to be a really good communicator because their Mercury is really emphasized. Then, of course, you got to look at what else the Mercury is doing. But the main thing is the stations are super powerful and you'll see this in all ephemeris. The only thing is what I'm drawing here is month positions, January, February, March. So you see these R's and these closer together. In almost every ephemeris you can get out there, you know, on the marketplace, they're doing it day by day. So you'll have to be scanning, you know, quite a bit to find those stationary positions because it'll be months apart in, in a lot of cases. So uh, now I should stop for a second there. This thing with, with uh, Zoom, what I notice is in order to see the, uh, the uh, place where you can chat, I have to stop the share. So I'm going to stop the share for a second in case anyone wants to ask any questions about what I just said so far. And please type it and grandiosity too much Jupiter. Yeah, that's true. That's exactly it, Nancy. <laughs> Exactly. And that, and that Pluto is malefic. Yes, it is. Very much so. No doubt about it. Uh, the, the ephemeris. Okay. So the ephemeris book. Uh, well, okay. So the one that is, you'll often see uh, American ephemeris is one title that is out there quite a bit. Uh, Neil Michelson is one of the programmers. If you uh, type ephemeris in Google or, in, or you go to Amazon, you'll see, you'll see the different ephemeris. And for sure, the American ephemeris, I, I, you know, you can trust it. It's good. It's really well done. Everything is clear. And as I was saying yesterday, if you can find it in um, if you can find it used, it's it's just as good as new for the most part. They usually tell you if it's in good shape. And you know, people have sometimes they got into astrology and then they stop and they'll sell it and it'll be a great pickup. And they're not hugely expensive. And keep in mind that uh, even when they're new, I mean, and keep in mind you're you're gonna use it a lot because that's your your go-to book to, up to the point where you might get a program if you really get into it, which will then allow you to do uh, the ephemeris you know, on the computer and the fact that you can find them online. And this is where you mentioned resources like AstroSeek, Astro.com. They've got all kinds of ephemerises and you can, you know, create bookmarks and you can take yourself there. It might be a little more work. You know, at the beginning when you're learning this too, if you think about things being too much work, then you probably aren't going to make a lot of progress because usually what what uh, what uh, makes for faster progress is just great interest. You're really keen to discover different things. So, all right, I'm going to go back now to sharing the screen again, and I'll I'll talk about the uh, Saturn as the you know the what I said yesterday, how important it is in in everything you say in life and astrology and everything. So let me switch here to this and back we go here so uh the link as i believe i tried to establish yesterday is in trying to provide shortcuts for people who are learning astrology so that they very quickly go and look for the stuff that really matters so you can right away get meaning and realize yes th there's something here now, rather than saying i'm just looking at this you know massive stuff and i don't know where to start and then it's all nuts and like what does it mean this is where saturn as the planet that you could say and you would not be wrong to say that saturn rules all manifestation because saturn uh, in the world you keep running into it in anything that has form and the first thing that has form is your own body that's what it is and in the body if you're going to the the most 
precise rulership of Saturn, you would say the skeleton and your teeth, the hired parts of your body. That's true. And so when you say something like musculature, there you're you're getting more into Mars, but writ large as a broader category, Saturn rules the body itself because the body as a as a temporary form something that the universe produces and produces many, many manifestations. That's automatically a Saturn feature. So of course, then you realize, well, it must be really important because it, it rules in a very real sense my existence. And then it gets even in a way deeper, more important when you realize that the, the mythology of these planets, for whatever reason, that probably requires an hour or two all by itself, you know, to explore how it is that these planets get named precisely as what they are. You know, they, how Pluto was named, how Saturn was named whatever. And then you discover what well, Saturn is Kronos, Saturn is time. It literally rules time. So then it's everything from in the material world, typically people who do well in the world, who are prosperous materially, are usually people who have good management of time. They have a good connection to Saturn, which allows them to manifest things. They use their time and they create something that has form. And I mentioned yesterday that for the most part, that is material and that if you say, well, I, I, uh, I'm working toward a house. There it is. I manifest a house. I manifest a car. Or even when you say I am manifesting a relationship that still has a sense of otherness to it, it's still call it material in some sense. But then you can include manifestation of form. It's a little more subtle because when you say you're manifesting a way of being, you could say that a couple of other planets get in there as well. But I still recognize Saturn in there in that Saturn, in addition to being, you know, the idea that things that are you know, tangibly dense and solid and you can touch them and they, they have an actual solid existence in form. Saturn is also, you could say, the totality of your structure psychologically, like all your habits put together, everything that you're doing. It's almost like in, in sports, in por- sports terms, you say it's your game. That's what you do that enables you to interact with life. And so even there, you're creating something though that would be more intangible. It's like a mental spiritual, uh, you could call it a vibration field, you could call it all kinds of things, but it's that sense. So Saturn is super important, but then you also think about how how if you're reading a, a, a business book, they're trying to give you ideas about how to organize your time, maybe make lists, create different compartments, all these different ideas. That's Saturn in the more material sense. In the spirit world, you often hear, be in the moment, be present. In a sense, they're telling you, get outside time. Well, you can do that, but you're still, it's still a time thing. A person who is masterful at living in the moment and being in presence has mastered Saturn. That's exactly what they've done. In a certain way, you could say they've connected to their sun energy, but you see, it's curious. Go back here for a second. This is where you see planets acting as polarities. When you see that in the sign alignment, the sun is the ruler of Leo and Saturn is the ruler of Capricorn and Aquarius. Uh, This, by the way, I'll mention now off the top. I use the ancient ruler rulers first and the second rulers as co-rulers. They're also important, but in other words, in this case, Uranus is connected to Aquarius too as a co-ruler, but Saturn is the first ruler. So you see the polarity is the sun opposing, uh, the the Leo opposing Aquarius, sun opposing Saturn. So Saturn is the polarity to the sun. In a sense, it's the, in that sense, it's the partner to the sun. You need to master Saturn in order to be in the right place with your son. If not, and there's a disconnect, or you could even argue there's there's an incompatibility, there's there's like a fight. That would be where the person is not managing time properly. And so then this is the thing with Saturn. If you realize that uh, once you say, okay, well, it's a principle of uh, creating form. There's a sense that things are denser. They come together. Right? The matter is closer together wherever Saturn is. So what, what's the plus of that? Well, things like concentration, focus, that's Saturnian. What's the bad side of that? Depression, right? Because it's, it's like a collapse where Jupiter is an expansion. Saturn is a contraction. Contraction and depression, they're in the same field. So uh, this is where if a person is, is having problems with depression, it means they're in astrology terms, almost always, it's the Saturn that is giving them the hardest time. They're having a hard time aligning aligning with Saturn, right? So um, now, when I said about the idea of making headway in interpreting and trying to understand what's happening in a chart. So there, what the astrologer does is gauge where Saturn is traveling. And Saturn is traveling in Aquarius through 2021, 2022, and into the spring of 23. So then you know that it's in the fixed sign of Aquarius. And you know that going back to this, you know that Saturn, let me get the actual symbol here to illustrate it. So Saturn ah, doesn't want to cooperate now all of a sudden. Let's see. All right. doesn't matter. So uh, 
Saturn is Saturn is in 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 Aquarius, and so then the four signs: Taurus, Aquarius itself, Taurus, Leo, and Scorpio are getting challenged during that period. And of course, for the astrologer, what the what the trick is that you then you then gauge, and this is where you know, again numbers are important because when you see one, five, eight, that's just telling you how far along the planet is traveling that sign. So you know that in 2021, Saturn gets as far as 13 and a half, backtracks, and by the end of the year, it's still at nine degrees, the whole year, the furthest they got is 13. So you know that the people whose sun degrees are up to that point, up to 13 degrees, which takes you into, uh, if you're born in as an Aquarius, it would be approximately February 5th, 6th, 7th, at the latest probably more like fifth. That's the furthest it'll catch and uh, create pressure on those people. The same is true though of the other signs as well. You look in here, same idea. You would look in the beginning of Scorpio up to close to the middle, the beginning of Leo, the beginning of Taurus. They're the ones that are getting more of the pressure, but then you know that the following year, 2022, then it goes further into the sign and it takes the pressure off those people, puts pressure on people that are born later in the sign. Right? And this is something that whoever you look at, public person, your friend, your yourself this is dead on right the saturn pressure is unmistakable and if you're doing things well it can even be pressure you can you can really use to help yourself grow because it's saturn is the idea of just get to work and do things try things you know work through it it's 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 very useful doing that where it's not useful is that at the same time as it's doing that and this is where saturn can be incredibly challenging is because of what i said earlier once you say saturn is the totality of your your psychological pattern it's all of your behavior your habits your way of doing things so it's essentially what in Eastern teachings they call karma. Your action is manifesting as this particular structure. So now that might betray you because you reach, you get into a Saturn period that is difficult and then the consequences of your actions can come into light. Now, of course, this tends to be more true or rather more visibly true and more spectacular with political figures because we'll find, we'll learn, oh, that person was robbing and stealing and look, now the Saturn comes in and they get punished. But even in anybody's life, right? The Saturn, uh, to give you an example of a Saturn cycle that might be a problem, right? To illustrate that. Let's say someone has Saturn connected to the eighth sign in either by transit or because it's doing something something uh, at birth. And, and so then when it circulates, it brings energy from that eighth sign. And suppose the person, for whatever reason, who knows what it is, maybe it's explained in the chart, maybe it's not, whatever, but they've had an aversion to taking care of their taxes. You know, they just put the, maybe they put the bills in a drawer or whatever. All of a sudden the Saturn comes by and that's when you can get a call from the IRS or worse because it brings it into the foreground and it can become, you know, a, a problem as a result. So it's, you could say, both the the capacity to work on something, improve it, make it better, but also the fact that you're facing the momentum of your previous actions, which is what tends to make Saturn quite difficult. But either way, you look at any chart and if you just establish where Saturn is, where it has been for the last while and where it's going next, you get a pretty good read on what that person's important stuff is. Um, and I believe yesterday, I'll show it again now, I brought up the chart of Bill Gates because this is you know, classic textbook astrology. He's a Scorpio and 2021 Saturn has been in fact, the sun is at five degrees, right? So by the logic of what you see here, by the beginning of the year, it crosses to five degrees here in around November. It's really October, but you can see it's six, seven degrees. That's uh, something also to remember that they don't have to be dead on. It just has to be close. You know, a couple of degrees, especially in a station, it's on you. So on the strength of that alone, you know that, that 2021 has a really strong Saturn flavor, not in an easy way because Aquarius makes a square to Scorpio, right? But then to add more, you know, classic meaning, this is textbook stuff. It, in any chart, the seventh, eighth, and ninth signs. So the line, the, the, the sign that has the line going through it is seven. That's the pure marriage house. The next one is eight. That's the house of shared uh, resources in the marriage. And then the ninth, the ninth you're getting out of that, but it's still a relational house, meaning that that's called the relationship quadrant, right? So you notice that it's got Saturn in the relationship quadrant and it's squaring and it's concurrent with the fact that his marriage ended. Although we have to throw Pluto in there just for more meaning because it turned out that Pluto in its cycle was pretty much precisely on this angle. And the angle in any, in any, uh, uh, chart, the, the line, the horizon line is the most sensitive point of all. Right? That's why knowing a time of birth is so powerful. There it was. 
right? And and what does Pluto do? Pluto will, it's great for ending something. You know, again, thing would be that, you know, if he gets this Pluto transit, uh, he was mar- he married Melinda in the 90s. If he gets this Pluto transit five years into the marriage, it probably would not have ended the marriage. Perhaps it would have uh, changed some important partnerships or something like that. It would have created some some other kind of turmoil. But this here is classic, classic. You know, the marriage itself and the fact that it, if you look it up in the ephemeris, it's it, I think it's stationed in late April and he announced, they announced rather the divorce in um, in early May, something like that, right? The, as an aside too, I'll just cover something else here because these are topics that I brought up yesterday. So the thing about the ascendant, I believe I mentioned something about how how it's really good from the beginning to you know have some sense of the astronomy of things. Like you're looking at actual stuff. It's not made up. You're actually mapping orbits and mapping the way the earth moves. And that's why I said, you know, retrogrades, they're not really retrogrades, they're optical illusions, but they function that way. And the ascendant is this, it's this arrow here, right? For Bill Gates, 26 degrees, 57 minutes, almost 27 minutes cancer rising. That is a line that you you cast going east. So if wherever you are, wherever you live, when you look directly east, that's where the ascendant is. But then you have to picture that you're on a, a sphere and gravity prevents us from, you know, flying off or feeling like we're moving. I mean, it, that's not going to happen, but the, it is moving. I mean, if you look up the speed of the earth, it's actually quite a quite a speedy thing, the amount of rotation in miles per hour. Um, and that's exactly what causes day and night to happen. And it's very significant that the earth in its movement spins toward the east. That's where it goes, right? And I don't think it's a coincidence that even in our language, when we say orienting yourself, the orient is the east. And it's the idea that that's where you find your direction, your compass, that's your ascendant, that's your birth point. It's the point that is most individual when you're born, like to the minute, because you can say, well, I have the moon in, in this case, the uh, uh, Gates has his moon in Aries. Sure. But the next day, people still have moon in Aries. Hours later, still they have a moon in Aries. Sometimes two days later, they have the moon in Aries. But this ascendant is really unique and it's very individualized. And the way you, you understand it is it, the earth is, if you imagine being on a big ball, it's falling into the east. It's turning that way. And when it's doing that, that's what makes it look like planets are rising because the sun doesn't rise. And the, the sun rises because the earth falls in that direction. And then you get daylight. The same thing happens on the other end. Uh, in, in that case, I mean, picture it, right? If this sphere is spinning that way, then these planets will will end up being below. Like, see where this is now? If it goes this way, these two will end up below, which is like having a sunset because they go below the line. Planets here, you won't see them. and You won't see them here. You only see them above and above. This whole part is the upper part. It's the part that is visible. In his case, uh, it turns out, you see, he was born at 10 p.m. It was night. So you would have seen a, a pretty bright moon in the sky up above, not quite full, because full would be if it was in Taurus. But this is a, actually, in some ways, a really good moon because it's in the 10th of career, which is a powerful you know, uh, career moon. And it's the ruler of his ascendant. That These are other categories you start adding. His ascendant is cancer. The moon rules it. This person is going to have power in, in their career, for sure. And where it's perhaps advantageous is that if it were in Taurus, it's full. In some ways, that makes it even better. It's more brilliant. It's more creative. But in some ways, it's also more unstable and more prone to ups and downs, whatever. So uh, it, having the moon in the sign just before is is really good because it's still really bright. Generally speaking, a bright moon is, is, is helpful. Right? So that's an explanation of how someone who says, all right, I'm going to study Saturn and they realize that, hey, I looked at the ephemeris, I can see this, right? It, it connects to, to what is happening to this person. And then same thing, if you happen to be, I know in this group, I think there are something like, there, there'll be at least 30, 40 people that are in fixed. I would encourage you to find out when exactly is Saturn affecting you, right? And if possible, either go back in memory, or if it's ahead, then experience it as it's happening and try to tune in to what the feeling is. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna um, unshare now so I can see some more uh, questions people might have or comments. Please type them in the... Uh, and now if you want to, the other thing we can do, if someone wants to unmute themselves, uh, just just type it and I'll, I'll, I'll... Or unmute... Well, let's see. Can, can that be done? We'll start by typing if you don't mind. So the Saturn effect, you're rising as well. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. The Saturn effect, you're rising. Uh, well, okay. So where's Saturn... Okay, so where's the best chart? Okay, so Saturn affects your rising uh, more 
if your rising is Aquarius or Capricorn, because Saturn rules those two signs, and then the other way it can affect your rising would be if it's transiting through there, which it turns out right now, if someone has Aquarius rising, of course, because Saturn rules that sign. And then there are other ways in which you can do it. See, this is where it gets kind of complicated. If Saturn is, is let's say someone is a... Um, uh, Scorpio rising and Saturn therefore would be transiting through the, if you, if you look at a, at a wheel, ah, I'm okay, I can't show that now from memory. If you, Scorpio is rising, Aquarius is in the fourth, the house of the home, but Saturn might be at a certain point, let's say that they're uh, hypothetically, you do their chart and they have 10 degrees Scorpio rising. That's why the degrees are so important. Then you look in the ephemeris and you see that Saturn is at 10 degrees Aquarius. That means it's making a square. That means it's squaring the rising degrees definitely is going to affect that rising that person's immediate life energy is affected and they will feel the saturn and have an, a saturnian experience so in that sense yes and in the other sense more broadly speaking and where's the best place okay so the, the best place that I, I believe i mentioned it last couple of times astro seek which is astro dash seek.com uh okay you looked at it and it was overwhelming <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, what I suggest with that is just go to the place where you can draw your chart, limit it to that and see if you can, you know, enter your data, put it all in. It, actually, the FM, the um, the, ma the map they use, the, um, you know, these uh, systems, they'll have a, an atlas built into the into the system and it's really accurate. As soon as you put the beginning of a city, whatever, bam, it'll tell you which one. And so you choose it, you get a chart and then figure out a way to, one way is to right click on it, copy like control C and then control V anywhere else will paste it. But there's likely a way, and I might be able to post that on the on Patreon on how to get the chart so you can then have it on your computer all the time and look at it. So I wouldn't, yeah, I mean, AstroSeek is, has a lot of techniques. Don't get lost in too much. Just at the beginning, that first page can give you a chart drawing and you also can see the listing of your planets by degree and by sign. And that's what I was getting at in the very first session that anybody that wants to learn astrology, your first task is where are your planets, right? And you don't have to even necessarily put them in the chart, though that helps immensely. But just seeing that they're in a listing and you know what they are is, is a start, right? So that, that's what I would do. And then leave the other stuff till later. A lot of that stuff gets way too advanced. They start doing whatever progressions, you know, all kinds of things. You just need to know more astrology for that, which is more practice. That's basically the answer to that. Uh, sun and I have sun and Aquarius at 19 degrees. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, yeah, with sun and, in fact, you can look it up. Okay, so sun at 19 degrees, you know that the it'll be in, I believe it's in the spring, in, a, in uh, the spring at, a, yeah, exactly like March. March is the month and then it kind of goes right through. But what is even perhaps more challenging is that Saturn makes a station at 18 and a half, which is really close to 19 in the pre-election period in October, right? Those are super important periods to keep in mind for someone with 19 degrees Aquarius. All right, this time I'm going to stop there uh, and thank everybody for coming and apologize again for yesterday's <laughs> void moon thing. And uh, we'll take it up again next week. But uh, I'm going to say now that uh, I, because I'm going to be coming back from California, instead of 1230, I'm going to set it up for two o'clock Pacific to give myself a little more more time to to get ready and then hopefully the following Sunday I'll return to the earlier time all right so happy Thanksgiving everyone and uh enjoy the moon in Leo during Thanksgiving which is a pretty interesting uh it's a pretty interesting <laughs> sign for Thanksgiving I think it's mostly good but I can think of a few you know maybe potential problems all right everybody take care and I will see you all soon <laughs>